Thank you. I'm gonna follow suit and uh, put my water bottle right there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ward. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's exciting to be here. Um, uh, I'm here today primarily to talk about innovation. Um, and one of the, uh, the articles that I guess uh, got me on the, the radar screen over here was an article that was basically titled, uh, Build Droids, Not Death Stars. The basic premise was that a sign of a good acquisition project would be one that is more droid-like, simple, low-cost, rapidly developed, as opposed to the Death Star approach, large, complex, expensive systems that take forever and keep getting blown up. Um, I have to admit, though, I, that concept wasn't entirely a Dan Ward original idea. Uh, it was my eight-year-old daughter who pointed that out. Um, we were uh, watching the Star Wars films, and, uh, and the final scene of the, the, the third movie, sixth movie, uh, episode uh, nine, I suppose it is, um, when, the set, when the Death Star was blown up in Return of the Jedi, um, she said, Daddy, they shouldn't build those Death Stars anymore. They keep getting blown up, because this is the second time we've seen one of these things explode. And I about fell out of my chair. I thought, well, the force is strong in this one. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and clearly, I, I need to write an article about this. So uh, anyway, I, I owe all my uh, writing success to, to my eight-year-old daughter. Um, OK, so uh, uh, the concept here, the, the specific topic uh, here today is called FIRE. Uh, FIRE stands for Fast, Inexpensive, Restrained, and Elegant. And it is basically a decision-making framework that I came up with to uh, help us make better decisions about acquisitions. I want to get double mic'd here. Um, so we're going to talk about innovation. We're going to talk about the way constraints affect innovation and really the way constraints help ignite innovation and encourage innovation. Um, we're going to talk specifically about how, how having too little is better than having too much. Now everybody loves space stuff, so I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about NASA. Uh, in the 1990s, NASA launched a, a series of missions called, under an umbrella called Faster, Better, Cheaper. Um, they launched 16 missions under this Faster, Better, Cheaper umbrella. And for about a period of seven years, the first nine, nine out of the first ten succeeded wildly. Um, so they had a seven-year time period where they had a 90% success rate with these missions. Now, these weren't just simple little science projects. These were some of the biggest, hardest projects that NASA does. And I, I used the wrong word there. I said biggest. They were actually relatively small as space systems go. So, for example, uh, the uh, image on the screen there is an artist's rendition of a uh, spacecraft called Stardust. Stardust had a, uh, an unusual mission, a unique mission. The first time we ever tried to do something like this, Stardust's mission was to fly through the tail of a comet, collect some particles, and return them to Earth. So it had three requirements. Fly through the tail of the comet, collect some particles, bring them back to Earth. They had a million dollars left in their budget on launch day. They were a million dollars under budget. Succeeded wildly, um, first, first in class, best in class, under budget. <clears throat> the program manager interestingly describes this, uh, this spacecraft as a very simple spacecraft. Now, that's not a word you often associate with spacecraft, simple. Um, and yet, within the genre of spacecraft, this was a fairly simple one. Now, it had a camera. It had other stuff. It took some pictures. It did some in-situ analysis on its way there, on its way back. Great, but those were all secondary and tertiary requirements, not primary requirements. So having that set of three primary requirements really helped focus their decision-making for their organization, their process, their technology design across the whole spectrum of decision-making. Uh, another faster, better, cheaper mission was the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous Project, NEAR. Uh, the NEAR spacecraft uh, was sent on an intercept course to the asteroid Eros. Its mission was to fly around, go into orbit around that asteroid, collect data, and beam it back to Earth. They collected 10 times more data than it was originally intended to collect. Uh, it had uh, a third of its budget was still remaining. Uh, so it did, it, it did its mission for about 66% you know, of its budget. It collected 10 times more data, and although it wasn't designed to be a lander, it landed on the asteroid so gently at about four miles an hour that it continued to collect and transmit data for another two weeks. A faster, better, cheaper approach. They simultaneously improved the cost, the schedule, and the performance, uh, not just hitting those targets, but exceeding those targets. They were under budget, they were ahead of schedule, and they did more than they were planned to do. Uh, the final one I, I want to mention from faster, better, cheaper was the Pathfinder mission to Mars. Mars is, is arguably one of the hardest things that NASA does. In fact, the, uh, the Russians sent 19 missions to Mars, succeeded zero times. So the saying within the space community is that Mars eats spacecraft. Um, the Pathfinder mission to Mars uh, was the first time NASA returned to Mars in 20 years. In the 1970s, we had the Viking mission to Mars, huge success. But Viking was so expensive and so difficult, it was 20 years before we even tried to go back. Pathfinder comes along for 1 15th the cost of uh, of Viking, one fifteenth the cost, was the first time we ever put a rover on another planet. We had planned to last a week, hoped it would last a month, it lasted 83 days. 
again, best in class, first in class, by using a very constrained approach, but still doing stuff that had never been done before, very difficult missions, very difficult environments. Um, the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous Project was famous for having three minute meetings, and they managed the whole project with a 12 line schedule. If you've ever looked at an acquisition schedule, it's often much longer than 12 lines. Um, but these guys went into orbit around an asteroid for the first time ever, collected 10 times the data, landed on the thing, and did it all with a 12 line schedule. So Professor Howard McCurdy wrote a great book called Faster, Better, Cheaper, and his analysis was that NASA proved, and we don't throw around words like proved very, very lightly, NASA proved it is possible to simultaneously improve the cost of the schedule and the performance. No need to pick two. Um, now, a more down-to-earth uh, example here, Utah State University's, uh, uh, a design team from Utah State University won the Air Force Research Lab 2013 Innovation Design Challenge with this little thing called the Bambi Bridge. Bambi stands for Break Apart Mobile Bridging and Infiltration Device. Uh, it's about a 27-pound 20, uh, device. It breaks down into a, a man-portable backpack type configuration. It replaces a 40-pound aluminum ladder. Uh, so the challenge was build a bridge, a portable bridge, which just stop and think about that concept for a second, a portable bridge. Um, a portable bridge that can cross a 20-foot uh, span that can go from backpack to setup in a, in a matter of minutes. Um, and it had to carry a weight of 350 pounds. And oh, by the way, have it do something else as well. AFRL wasn't particularly picky about what that secondary function might be. They just said, give me a bridge, and, and it should have some secondary service. And so this can be used as a, uh, as a stretcher to carry somebody who's, who's been injured. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, this winning design um, the team member said that other teams used inflatables, they used telescoping devices, uh, but none of the other competing teams were as light as this one. Uh, and they said the simpler our, our design, the simpler we made it, the more lighter it became. Now, please don't be misled by the simplicity of, uh, of this design. This kind of simplicity is terribly difficult to achieve. It's not automatic. It, uh, it takes some effort. Um, Utah State University team's initial designs were sort of Rube Goldberg devices. They had, you know, relying on materials that don't technically even exist yet uh, and doing all kinds of crazy things. And they said, the more we simplified it, the better it got. Um, and again, these, this is the team that ended up winning. We'll talk, there's one more interesting fact about them that I'll mention in a little bit. Now, I could go on all days with lots of other, uh, with lots of other examples, and sometimes I do. Um, but I want to step back a little bit now and take a look at what these systems have in common, both the bridge and the, uh, the spacecraft. When I started initially investigating innovation, studying it, looking into it, uh, I want to know, how does innovation happen? How do we do it when we do it well? Um, what's the secret sauce? Uh, it turns out there is a common theme, whether we're talking about spaceships or bridges, uh, submarines or, or software. Now, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical of words like proven and words like recipe, especially when we're talking about innovation. But the formula looks something like this. Uh, I think this guy's onto something, president and CEO of Calico Commerce. Uh, the company has bought out and has a new name now. But um, this idea of a small, intensely focused team um, with an unreasonable time frame, the thing I would add to this is an inadequate budget. So if we get an unreasonable time frame and an inadequate budget, that formula tends to lead to creative approaches, creative solutions. So when innovation happens, it's usually the result of this approach. When we don't have a lot of time and money, we are forced to find interesting ways to solve problems. Um, the obvious solution is off the table, and we have to go do something different. And the end result is not only innovative, but tends to be not also effective and affordable. Uh, so the thing I didn't mention about that winning bridge design, um, that team from Utah State University had half the budget of the 19 other universities uh, that competed in this program. Um, why do they have half the budget? Well, Utah State uh, took a, an interesting strategy. They fielded two teams. So they took the money, the $20,000 that AFRL had, uh, had allocated to, to each school, and said, we're going to divide that in half. We'll fund two teams. And it was that budget, or that team with half the budget, that was the winning team. All right, so again, that's the team that won. Now, for those of you who prefer hard numbers, any other engineers uh, in the room? A couple engineers, very good. Takes a while for the engineers to raise their hand. Do we really need to raise our hand on this? Um, if you prefer hard numbers over uh, pretty pictures and, and interesting stories, uh, here you go. So this data on the screen is from the Standish Group. Uh, they're a Boston-based consulting company. And they took a look at success rates of IT development projects over uh, about a five-year time period. And this was uh, from 1999, but subsequent uh, research came up with basically the same, the same results. Now, I want to point out, this is not predictive data. This is measured data. This is observed data. Uh, and the trend that they have is, is pretty striking here. So what's interesting is that the success rate based uh, compared to duration, how much time we spend versus how much money we spend versus how big, it's basically the same curve. 
So it almost doesn't matter whether that x-axis is time, money, or size. It's all basically this pattern. Um, and all four situations, less is more. So again, whether we're talking about spending more money, spending more time, putting more people on it, making the thing more complicated, all of these additions reduce the likelihood of success. Now let me, let me talk to that word success for a second here. The way the standards group defines success is on time, on budget, with all the features and functions as originally envisioned. It's not a bad definition of success. There are better definitions of success, but that's the one that they chose to use, and, and it's not bad. But it's important to understand that when we have a 0% success rate out of this, that doesn't mean these products didn't, or projects didn't deliver anything. It doesn't mean these projects you know, were, were complete and total failures. It just means they cost more, they were behind schedule, and they didn't do everything they said they were going to do. Uh, so you might still deliver something that's great, but you ended up paying more, waiting longer, and it actually does, does less, or some combination thereof. Um, so this data seems to suggest that if we want to deliver on time, on budget, with all the features and functions as originally envisioned, we should aim to stay as close to the left of this curve as we can, um, using short schedules, small budgets, small teams. Now, it's also been suggested that the Standish data is basically documenting and measuring estimation accuracy, um, meaning that uh, you know, these, when you're down here, you have an accurate estimate of how much time and money you'll need. And when you're out here, you end up needing more time and money because your estimate wasn't very accurate. Um, it's a reasonable critique uh, of the data. It's a reasonable observation, really, of the data. Um, but even if the only finding is that long-range estimates, where we're talking about large dollar figures, that those estimates tend to be inaccurate, those estimates tend to be wrong, uh, that is itself an interesting thing to note and probably suggests to us that we shouldn't put too much faith, too much emphasis on estimates for you know how many 20 years, $20 billion type projects, those estimates are probably going to be wrong. Uh, in fact, somebody pointed out that, for, especially for long projects, we make decisions about cost and schedule when we know the least about the project. Uh, and so there's a paper called uh, two, guesses and a, uh, two Guesses and a Condition. Uh, and so the idea of you know, we have these budget estimates, let's call them budget guesses. We have schedule estimates, we should probably call them scheduled guesses. They may be informed guesses, um, but oftentimes these are formed when we know the least. How do we know the most? How do we improve the, the accuracy of our estimates? By shortening the timeline, reducing the budget, and, and simplifying things. Okay, so the Standish researchers go on to argue that smaller is better, that time is a project's enemy. And on the topic of simplicity, their research says the fewer the features, the greater the yield. The fewer the features, the greater the yield. You know, pretty much every piece of consumer electronics I've ever bought does way more than I need it to. Every digital camera, every uh, computer, every laptop <coughs> does more than my, my cell phone. It has features I don't even know it has. I paid for every single one of those features when I bought the thing. Um, but uh, again, I, I've sort of, I'm the oversold consumer. Uh, the one example, the, or the one uh, exception to that, uh, to that situation is uh, I have a, a first generation iPod shuffle. Um, looks like a pack of gum, it's like 10 years old. There's no screen. If I want to know what music, what song is playing, I have to listen to the earbuds. If I want to know what song is next, I have to push the next button and listen to the earbuds. Um, so there's no address book. There's no games. There's no calculator. There's no calendar. It just plays music in random order. Uh, so that is the one piece of consumer electronics that I own that doesn't do anything I don't need it to do. And it's perfect. And I love it. And I, and I, I still use it all the time. Um, do I really need when I'm listening to music in the, in the gym? a calculator and a game and all that other stuff? Probably not. Uh, and yet, that's, uh, that's what we have. So that's an example of the, uh, the fewer the features, the greater the yield. OK, so I kind of put all these concepts together into, or put all these pieces together into a concept that I call FIRE, which I, I mentioned earlier. FIRE stands for Fast and Expensive, Restrained and Elegant. Uh, HarperCollins was actually kind enough to publish this book. comes out in a couple weeks. Um, <clears throat> and FIRE aims to provide a decision-making framework uh, to help us move our projects to that left side of the curve. Uh, not just for the purpose of, of achieving our programmatic goals, you know, on time, on budget, that kind of stuff, but primarily, <coughs> fundamentally, uh, for the purpose of satisfying our users' objectives, making sure that what we deliver meets those, those users' needs. So it's not just about saving time and money, it's about delivering products that are first in class, best in class, uh, or both. So the book is full of stories about uh, innovation attempts that succeeded and innovation attempts that failed. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of failed projects uh, in a little bit here. And these cases all sort of feed into a set of heuristics. So rules of thumb, um, shortcuts that help uh, guide our decisions, primarily on R&D projects. Uh, but this can also be applied to contracts and services and, and any time where we're sort of creating something. 
Uh, the overarching heuristic uh, within this whole FIRE concept is one that I call the FIRE Prime Directive. Uh, so any other uh, science fiction fans uh, in the audience? So we heard about the Star Wars uh, piece of this. Now we're going to talk Star Trek. Um, so in Star Trek, the Prime Directive, for those uh, who, who haven't seen the, the show, the Prime Directive basically says uh, it's a non-interference policy. It says we should not introduce advanced technology into civilizations and worlds and, and cultures that are not ready for those technologies. So the main one they typically talk about is warp drive. You, can't, you shouldn't give a warp drive to a group of cavemen. They're going to hurt themselves with it is the, the basic concept. Um, so the fire prime directive sort of mirrors that, that wisdom, mirrors that idea. The key is to don't necessarily insert advanced, don't unnecessarily insert advanced technology in places where it doesn't belong. So our default should be to only include the things that are necessary to achieve our objectives and to strenuously ab avoid over-engineering things. Uh, unfortunately, that has to be said explicitly. We have to be told, don't over-engineer things. Because as an engineer, I like to over-engineer things. I like to add new features and functions and, and new widgets and make the thing shiny and, and gold-plated. Um, that's our default setting. So the, the idea with uh, the Fire Prime Directive is to set our default in the other direction. Now, just like in Star Trek, the Fire Prime Directive uh, is a general guideline. It's often bent, often twisted, often ignored, um, more honored in the breach sometimes, but never set aside sloppily, never set aside without reflection beforehand and after. So you might say, hey, here's a situation where, you know, we kind of ignored this Fire Prime Directive. We, we included some advanced technology that... You know, maybe we ordinarily wouldn't have, but here's why, and we, we think about it and we talk about it. Um, so, for example, that, uh, that near-Earth asteroid rendezvous project that NASA did, um, the program manager for that, uh, kind of a program management geek, I actually really enjoy reading interviews with program managers where they talk about their projects. Why did they make the decisions that they did? How do they brag about their projects? And, and this guy says, you know, I said no to a lot of good ideas. He said, people came to me and said, oh, what if we add this? What if we add that? <gasps> what if this system does these other things? And I, and I like the way he, he responded to that. I said no to a lot of good ideas. He honored those ideas. Hey, this is a good idea, but we can't do that on this project because it will increase the cost, increase the weight, increase the schedule. We're going to miss our launch window. We're just not going to do it. So imagine if they had said, hey, we're going to build this to be a lander. Wouldn't it be great if we could land on the asteroid? Um, they did not build it to be a lander. But even in the absence of that mechanism, they still got that capability. It was a simple enough uh, spacecraft. They had money and time left over. They achieved all their objectives. And at the end of the day, they're like, you know, we've already got 10 times more data than we thought we were going to get. Let's land on that thing. And, and they did without having to build that capability in. So I think they're a great example of really following that, that prime directive and not unnecessarily inserting technology that really was, was extra. Okay, so with that as a foundation, I want to take a closer look at the four pieces of fire. Uh, the fast piece says it is important and good to have a short schedule and to deliver products quickly. Uh, it's about designing our organizations and our processes with speed in mind. Uh, it's about creating requirements that can be satisfied on a short timeline, not writing requirements that we know full well are going to take 10 or 20 years to satisfy. Uh, the key is to treat the schedule as a constraint to be lived within and to be accepted rather than a starting point to be expanded on later. Um, so fast means we don't try to solve our problems by just adding time. Adding time, inserting delays is an ineffective problem-solving technique, very common one, but it's not the most effective way to do it. Now, the twist here is that fast doesn't mean hasty. There's a difference between being genuinely fast uh, and being superficially fast, cutting corners that shouldn't be cut, uh, skipping essential steps in the development process, in the contracting process, in the review process. So when I say fast, it's about performing those essential steps uh, rapidly and allowing the schedule to constrain the design. And I like to point out that in that famous Greek race, the tortoise was faster than the hare because he got to the finish line first. So again, it's not about necessarily sprinting and then having to take a nap. It's got to be a more sustainable speed. Now, the Government Accountability Office tells us that good programs have short timelines, and that's why I have a man on a short cycle uh, for my picture here. So in other words, the, the GAO is saying that it is good and important to have a short schedule. And another way of saying that is that the, it is, uh, the fast value is a productive value. Let me talk about that word value for a second. I use the word value not the way a politician or a theologian or an ethicist might use the word value. I use it the way an engineer uses the word value, meaning our preferences and priorities, our um, measures of merit, the desirable attributes 
Uh, and so speed is, is a value, having a short schedule, saying it is good and important to have a short, short schedule. That's an expression of what I call the fast value, uh, or valuing speed. So it turns out you can do this in just about any regulatory environment. When you have an option to make a decision, you can put together a shorter timeline or a longer timeline. And nothing forces us to pick the longer timeline. Now, that, that bottom, uh, that ceiling, we can only go so fast. Uh, but we can get a lot closer to that floor of speed than, than we typically do. And it turns out being slow causes a whole bucket of other problems. Um, well, we've known this for decades. Uh, in fact, in 1986, the Packard Commission came out with a, a very large and influential report. And one of the things they pointed out that long timelines are a central problem that drive all kinds of other problems. So the next time you're given an inadequate schedule, remember to be thankful. Uh, someone's doing you a big favor by preventing you know, all these other problems from popping up. Uh, so the funny thing about delays, though, is they tend to be self-propagating. Uh, see, the more you delay, the more change your project is exposed to. Uh, which slows you down even more because then you have to reconfigure and adapt to each of these additional changes. So new, uh, new people bring new ideas, new technologies come and go, new threats come and go, uh, politicians change, economies change, uh, and each of those changes requires us to make additional changes to respond. New technology comes up, now I need to either incorporate that or address it somehow. A threat goes away, a new threat arises, new boss comes in, new engineer comes in, and the more time we spend, the more change we are exposed to. Uh, and boy, once you get into this cycle, it's awfully hard to break out. Not impossible to break out, there are ways. And uh, the Software Engineering Institute put out a great paper called Acquisition Archetypes. Great little simple line drawings of lines and arrows. You can download it, it's a, it's a free report. And they have some examples of how do you get into the situation and how do you get out of the situation. I highly recommend taking a look at that paper. Um, but despite the fact that uh, once we get into the cycle, it's awfully hard to get out, one of the first things a program manager does when we uh, are faced with a challenge is we ask for more time. Uh, and that's almost never a good idea. So the FIRE approach encourage us, encourages us to find better approaches. Uh, and it begins with not asking for more time in the first place. Okay, so the I and Fist, uh, sorry, the I and FIRE says it's important and good to have a small budget. Uh, anybody want to sign up for a small budget? Nobody. All right. Awesome. <laughs> so being inexpensive is about designing our processes and our organizations with thrift in mind. Uh, it's about creating requirements that can be satisfied on tight budgets rather than writing requirements that we know full well are going to take billions uh, to address. Uh, so the key is to treat the budget as a constraint, not a starting point to be expanded on later. And what's interesting is that the large expensive projects are more likely to overrun their budgets. When you have a lot of money, you're more likely to spend more. But these thrifty small projects are more likely to underrun their budgets. And when you look at NASA's Faster, Better, Cheaper missions, almost all of them ended up with, when they finished, they didn't have a lot of money to start with, they had money left in the bank when they were done. Um, interesting dynamic. And I think the idea is when you have a tight budget, you are driven by thrift, and you're less likely to ask for more. You're more likely to say, hey, I don't have a lot of money. We can't waste this here. Um, but just like being fast doesn't mean being hasty. Being inexpensive doesn't mean cheap. So it's not about the superficial appearance of thrift. It's not about just picking the lowest bidder or buying stuff that doesn't last. Uh, because a low-cost solution that doesn't work is actually a pretty expensive solution. Um, so the inexpensive piece is about genuinely maximizing the bang for the buck. So back to NASA for a minute. Uh, the Clark satellite was one of those faster, better, cheaper missions. One of two remote sensing birds that, uh, that they uh, worked on. Um, the other one was named, of course, Lewis. So the Lewis and Clark satellites, sadly, unlike our, uh, the, the pioneers they were named after, sadly neither the Lewis nor the Clark satellite uh, was a success. Uh, Lewis burned up in orbit, one of the most exciting ways to, to fail with a satellite, uh, but Clark didn't get that far. Uh, Clark was actually just canceled. Uh, why was it canceled? It was canceled because its cost growth exceeded 15%. Um, was that a failure? Yes but it was also a success of the faster, better, cheaper method. You see, when they wrote the contract for all of these, they said, if your cost growth exceeds 15%, we will cancel you. It was known from day one. It, we set the expectations. Do not exceed your cost growth by 15%. And, and they weren't going to say, hey, you know, you hit 16, bam, you're gone. Clark was actually on track to hit 22% uh, over budget. It's the, one of the few that, that actually was over budget. A couple others were. Um, but the newspaper accounts of this time talk about this as a long-anticipated cancellation. We saw this coming. We knew it was going to happen so that when they finally pulled the trigger and says, we're stopping, we're terminating Clark, um, there wasn't a lot of angst. There wasn't a lot of surprise and shock. Uh, in contrast, 
uh, other projects, uh, for example, the Army's Comanche helicopter or the, uh, not to pick on the Army, um, when that one was canceled, um, people stood up and said, I, I can't believe we're canceling this. We, we've only spent 22 years and $7 billion, and we haven't finished designing the thing yet. Um, but why would you cancel us? Uh, you know, again, with that one, there was no contractual trigger. There was no expectation that if your cost growth exceeds a certain point, you should cancel it. So I refer to this as the Clark rule. There's nothing stopping us from, in every contract we ever write, establishing some threshold. 15% is not a bad place to start, but pick 22, pick 7, pick, pick whatever number uh, fits to, for your genre, for your situation. Um, but again, when we set it into the contract up front, it gives us a way to address these issues when costs go, uh, go south. Uh, and the truth is we actually don't need all that much money. In uh, uh, 2009, the Secretary of the Air Force and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force signed out what they called their Acquisition Improvement Plan. And uh, they said most of our requirements could be satisfied at, at less cost. Uh, other analysis have come up with a number of about 50%, that we could do most of our projects for about 50% of the cost. Um, that's not my number, but uh, it makes me feel conservative when, <laughs> when they say we could do it for half the price. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of data that does suggest on the order of 50 to 60% uh, is not an unreasonable bogey to shoot for. Uh, and, and when they say satisfied, they don't mean we can squeak by. They don't mean we can just do the minimum. They mean we can deliver world-class, unmatched, completely dominant capabilities at a lower cost. And the same dynamic occurs in, in other marketplaces. There are always options and alternatives that uh, can satisfy our, our needs for, for less money. So here's an example of, of what that looks like exactly. In World War II, the bazooka went from concept to fielded in quantities of thousands. Anybody know? 30 days. 30 days. Uh, the bazooka put an unprecedented amount of firepower into the hands of the infantry, and uh, General Eisenhower actually listed it as one of the four weapons that won World War II for the Allies. Um, it was a $19 piece of equipment. It was basically a metal pipe with a couple doodads welded onto it. And what was special about the bazooka is that it was inexpensive enough and simple enough you could put it into the hands of a 19, 20-year-old infantryman, and if he breaks it, that's okay. If he gets it dirty, that's okay. It wasn't an exquisite gold-plated piece of wonder technology that we better not give it to anybody who's got dirt under their fingernails because they might, they might break it. You know, we have to keep that stateside. Um, now, it turns out that Bazooka 1.0 was not as effective against the oncoming tanks as we needed it to be. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a famous battle whose name escapes me at the moment where they shoot the bazooka and the tanks keep coming and they're like, well, that's interesting. Um, but what, what was also interesting is that uh, Bazooka 1.0 was highly effective against enemy pillboxes, which is not something the engineers had in mind. It's something the infantry guys figured out. Infantry guys are good about that. Um, within six months, they had Bazooka 2.0, and that one was as effective against the oncoming tanks as we needed it to be. You can compare that to the, uh, to the M16 uh, rifle, which after a 20-year development timeline was fielded and had all the same problems that the bazooka had. It took a lot longer than six months to fix those. It took a lot longer than 30 days to find them even. So the idea that spending a long time and a lot of money is going to somehow guarantee us a positive outcome is just not held up by the data. And it turns out that short timelines, short, tight budgets, low levels of complexity allows us to field things in sufficient quantity to actually use them, try them, get some feedback from the people who, who have it in their hands, and then we can use that to spiral into the next improvement, spiral into the next uh, block, iteration, whatever we want to call it. <clears throat> so the low price, low price made it possible to deliver things quickly because we simply didn't have enough t uh, money to take a long time. Uh, and it also let us buy enough, like, again, these were $19 a piece, let us buy enough of them to make a real difference on the battlefield. Okay, so the R in fire stands for restrained. Uh, restraint is kind of the common thread that runs through this whole thing. Uh, it's essentially the opposite of a preference for expansion and growth. Uh, it's about small budgets, small teams, short schedules, short documents. Uh, and yes, there's a point at which an organization isn't large enough to do the work. Uh, there's a point at which a document or briefing doesn't convey all the necessary information, but we can get a lot closer to that, uh, to that boundary than we typically do. Um, another quick story here. The, uh, F-16 and the F-15, two fighter jets, were developed in around the same time, in the early 1970s. The request for proposal for the F-16 was 25 pages long. The request for proposal for the F-15 was 250 pages long, an order of magnitude larger. Proposals came in about 50 to 60 pages for the F-16. Proposals for the F-15 were 2,000 pages. Nothing in the policy, nothing in the requirements, nothing in the law forced the F-16 to write such a tightly focused request for proposal. They chose to do it because they valued restraint. They said it is important and good for us to have a tightly focused document and to, and, and end of the story, um, 
the F-16 was developed in half the time and half the cost of the F-15. Both fine aircraft. Uh, we're going to get about 50 years of service out of both of them. But if we can do both approaches, if both the expensive, complicated, long approach and the simple, restrained, inexpensive approach, if those both will get us a good aircraft, gosh, shouldn't we do the one in half the time and half the, half the money? Because then that lets us do more of other things. All right, so one of the stories in my book tells uh, about the time I failed to exercise some restraint. Um, it's one of those weird stories in the book. It's about buying a dishwasher, and it's the story that everybody asks me about when they read the, the advanced copies. Um, so my wife and I had, went out, and we, you know, we're grown up, so we had to go buy a dishwasher. Nothing makes you feel like a grown up, like buying a major appliance. Um, so uh, we had done our research. We looked at consumer reports. We knew exactly what we wanted, and we walked into that store, and we found it on the shelf, and we knew what we wanted to pay, and boy, we were ready, and, and we, this is the one. So the salesman comes over, and he says, oh, yeah, great. This is a good dishwasher. You did a nice job. Let me show you this next one. So he, he upsold us uh, to the, the, for $50 more, only $50 more. The top rack on this other one, if you flip a lever and pull a switch and stuff, it goes up and down by two or three inches. Well, I had to have that feature. So I, I paid the extra 50 bucks for the top rack that goes up and down. The whole time we owned that dishwasher, I didn't move that rack up, not down, not once. <laughs> <sighs> so <laughs> I, I paid more for, for a feature I, I didn't know I needed, never ended up using. And again, in, in that case, did that extra 50 bucks have any impact on my lifestyle? Not at all. Um, and that's one of those features where if, if I did want to add it later, it would have been much more expensive to add that in at a, at a later date. So gosh, this is my opportunity to get this. The point, though, is um, I failed to follow that FHIR prime directive. Uh, I was inserting technology, inserting features and functions and capabilities that really I didn't need. Uh, and it was funny, I, there was a hint there as, as this guy was selling it to us. The hint where he said, let me, let me tell you a story. He said, do you, or let me ask you a question. Do you ever have a big dinner over at your house? Yes, sometimes we have a big, like Thanksgiving or something. Oh, we eat Thanksgiving dinner. Yes, we do. Um, and he says, you know, and so sometimes your dishes just won't fit into the rack. Oh, that's possible. Now, I can't think of, of ever having a Thanksgiving dinner where my dishes couldn't fit into the dishwasher, but I was open to that possibility. <laughs> Um, so he says, so this will, you can lower down, you can fit stuff in. And um, the clue there was, uh, in that case where I have a dish that doesn't fit in the dishwasher, I could wash them by hand. Um, and this happens once a year, maybe, unless I go back home and then we're at my parents' house and it's not my dishwasher anyway. Um, so in that scenario, even when, as he was laying it out, there were hints there and clues that, you know, this extra feature sounds kind of shiny and new and nice and it's not that expensive, but yeah, maybe I didn't need to do that. Okay, so an alternative to my dishwasher story was NASA's Stardust mission. Uh, I mentioned before the program manager described it as a simple spacecraft, a simple spacecraft with a focused mission. They basically had three requirements, fly through the comet, collect some particles, bring them home. It was a huge success, and what's really interesting is this spacecraft went on to salvage a later mission. The Deep Impact uh, mission that NASA launched uh, was going to go out and take a look at another one of these comets zipping around through the universe. And, and the idea was to send an impactor to hit this comet called VILT-2. And it was going to create a create crater, and Deep Impact was going to take pictures of the crater, and we were going to learn about the, you know, how this uh, piece of space rock, space ice, you know, what it was constructed of, what it was made of. We are going to learn about the nature of this comet. So it, it goes off, sends the impactor, creates the crater. Turns out VILT-2 was a lot dustier than anybody knew it was. So it kicks up this big cloud of dust. So uh, Deep Impact is taking pictures of a dust cloud, not a, uh, not a crater. Um, not the helpful information we were looking for. Um, so although uh, uh, Stardust had already traveled some two to three billion miles, um, six years later, on uh, actually uh, Valentine's Day, they had a romantic rendezvous in space. Six years later, the dust had settled, and this, air, this spacecraft was able to take pictures of the crater because they had some additional capability left over. Um, was never part of the design. In fact, Deep Impact launched several years after Stardust. So this was already up in space. And they said, hey, you know, we have this problem. Can you come help us? These simple, low-cost systems tend to do more than promise. They tend to outperform their specs. Um, because a simple architecture has fewer failure modes, it's more reliable, more robust, less likely to, to break, more likely to do stuff that was never envisioned. OK, so the E in FHIR stands for elegant. Uh, and elegant refers to pleasingly and ingeniously simple. Uh, it basically means it is important and good to have a low level of complexity. So this is all about designing our organizations and our processes with simplicity in mind. Uh, it's about creating requirements that can be expressed clearly and relying on mature, proven technologies. 
So simple means we don't equate complexity with sophistication. Uh, and we understand that true sophistication, true design maturity, uh, true process maturity is shown by simplicity, not complexity. In other words, complexity is nothing to brag about. But simple doesn't mean superficial simplisticness. Uh, and we'll talk about that more shortly. So the thing is, simple systems tend to outperform more complex systems. The Army uh, wrote their uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom uh, report shortly after Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, and they pointed out that complexity makes systems unusable and irrelevant. When I read this line in that report, it was sort of burned into my soul, and I, I've never forgotten it. Uh, I managed to lose my copy of that report, and I haven't been able to find it again. <laughs> but uh, um, if anybody has a copy of that, I would love to, to get it back again. But I do remember this line. Complexity reduces, simplest, reduces systems to irrelevance. And uh, the same happens uh, not only in, in combat, but in, in other places as well. See, overcomplexifying things is funny when Rube Goldberg does it on purpose. It's less funny when we do it to ourselves uh, in real life. So when we focus on simplicity, it can help trigger what we call a virtuous cycle that reinforces and, and amplifies things like speed and things like thrift. Uh, so when we simplify our processes, when we simplify our architectures, when we simplify our documents, we simplify our organizations, we reduce friction, uh, which leads to a faster, more efficient flow. Uh, and unlike a snowball that gets bigger as it rolls down the hill, uh, the reverse snowball effect is basically going up the hill and your snowball is getting smaller. Um, it helps us get faster, cheaper, smaller, uh, as if that snowball was, was rolling in reverse. Now, simplification doesn't happen by fiat. Uh, it's not easy, it's not automatic, and it's not permanent. Uh, our natural inclination is to add complexity, to add features and functions, to add more, more words to our documents. Um, but it is possible to simplify. And it starts with refusing to overvalue complexity. It starts with making uh, a decision that simplicity is a sign of sophistication, and it starts with wanting to simplify. So again, that F-16 request for proposal, 25 pages, uh, that was because the people involved with that project said, we're going to do this for 25 pages. Um, a couple years back, uh, the Pentagon made some headlines when it was revealed that uh, they occasionally write complicated specs for the, the gear we use. Um, you may have, have heard of this particular story, the spec involved, or the spec in question, uh, was not about an aircraft carrier, it wasn't about a fighter jet, it was about a brownie. Um, the Recipe for a military brownie that goes in our, our MREs is 26 pages long. One page more than the RFP for the F-16. Um, do those full 26 pages make the thing more delicious? Uh, hard to tell. Um, could we have gotten a better result with a shorter document? Uh, probably. Uh, at the very least, we would have spent less time and less money reviewing and evaluating and reading these 26-page specs. Now, to be fair, the recipe for, uh, for oatmeal cookies is also in, that, uh, in those 26 pages, so I don't want to oversell the case too much. All right, so uh, once we've decided that simplicity is, is desirable, we can begin to add some, or apply, some techniques and practices to help reduce the complexity around us. Uh, one such practice is called trimming, uh, and it can be applied to anything from a PowerPoint presentation or a document to a system architecture or a software program. So I'm going to walk you through real quick how this diagram works. You start up at the very top where you take your, your thing that you're working on, again, PowerPoint presentation, system architecture, contract, what, what have you, and you remove one piece. Now the question is, does the thing still do what it needs to do in the absence of that piece? Uh, if it does, then you can try again and remove another piece. Does it still work? Hey, we can keep going through this loop until you get to the point where, hey, it doesn't work anymore. I need to put that piece back. Uh, and then at some point, whether you run out of time or run out of money or you're just satisfied that your design is as optimal as you're going to get it, then you say, okay, do I want to try again anymore? No, I don't want to try again anymore. Now we have our final design. So there's a couple strategies you can use for this, uh, for this particular practice. Uh, you can take out the obvious parts. Sometimes you look at a design, you're like, I know I don't need that. I can take it out. Or you can sort of kind of close your eyes and randomly take a part out, just arbitrarily remove something and say, huh, what did I take out? Uh, can I still do what I need to do? You'd be surprised how often that works. Um, but the really exciting strategy is to take out a part that you know you need. Boy, I know that's essential. What if I remove that? So I'm going to take my, my fighter jet. I'm going to take the pilot out. We won't even have a pilot in the aircraft anymore. Can I still make that work? Oh, well, there are ways to do that, and now we have drones. What's interesting is that once we remove one piece, oftentimes that deletion leads to other deletions. I took the pilot out. Now I don't need an ejection seat. I don't need an oxygen system. I don't need a lot of things. Uh, so all of a sudden, my aircraft gets much smaller, much simpler, um, less expensive to operate, to build to maintain. Uh, so another technique is a, is a little brain hack that I call storm draining. Everybody knows brainstorming, right? So after you do your brainstorming, the next step would be storm draining. Uh, it's a companion practice to brainstorming that's aimed to uh, help mitigate some of the unintended consequences of brainstorming. 
See, I think we may have done something terrible to our brains with all our brainstorming sessions. Brainstorming is fun. There's usually donuts. And, you know, when we, when we do these brainstorming sessions, what we've done through a process of just classical conditioning, we've trained ourselves to associate addition with rewards. I put stuff out, I brainstorm some ideas, I put them up on the whiteboard, I get a donut. Yes! Um, and so that trains our, our brain. Every time we, we add stuff to our designs, we get these, these psychic rewards, whether it's donuts or people like, oh, that's a good idea. Um, the result is, is a lot of ideation, but not necessarily the quality of ideation that, that we need. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the research that suggests, you know, brainstorming is not a very effective way of, of problem solving. I think it has its value. Um, but what it has done, we, we've trained ourselves to associate adding things to a design with rewards. Delicious, delicious rewards. So storm draining is a reductive thinking process. It's designed to distill a large collection of ideas down to the critical few, to balance out that, that additive inclination that's inherent in brainstorming. And so just like with brainstorming, there's a couple simple rules. Number one, everything is on the table. When you look at the, the set of, of things you're, you're drawing down from, anything can, can come off. Uh, second two, delete is the default. So just like in brainstorming, adding is your default mode. If you think you have an idea, you're not sure if you should say it out loud, say it out loud. With storm draining, oh, I'm not sure we should delete this one, delete it. That should be the default mode. Uh, three, build on other people's deletions. You say to take the pilot out. Hey, you say we can take the, the ejection seat out. So each deletion leads to subsequent deletions. Number four, make it fun. There should be donuts. <laughs> you know, there should be some sort of, of reward again, because we're trying to do a, a brain hack, rewire our reward centers a little bit. And number five, when you delete something, really delete it. Uh, so don't, hey, I'm going to take this off, but we're going to stash this over here because we might want to come back to it. Now, the fear, of course, is at the end of a, of a storm draining session, you have a blank sheet of paper. You've got your whiteboard has nothing left on it. If that's the case, what does that tell us about the quality of the ideas that we came up in the first place? Um, but that happens less often than you might think. When you do a storm draining session, what that typically finds is that the group coalesces around, you know, this is the thing that really matters. This is the thing we really need. Um, and again, if you come down at the end of it, you have a, a blank whiteboard. Time to do some more brainstorming again. All right, so uh, back to the 30,000 foot level, we took a look at a, at a couple specific practices. Um, but now I want to talk a little more broadly about some of these heuristics that I mentioned at the beginning. So fire is a heuristic based concept. And one of the fundamental heuristics, uh, rules of thumb, uh, is this, constraints foster creativity. You know, I think a lot of times we, we overestimate the importance of time and money. Uh, having a lot of time and money to do something might, uh, might sound nice, but it can actually stifle innovation. Constraints, on the other hand, act as a forcing function to help us think differently. Uh, when time and money are short, we simply can't do the obvious. We have to get creative, and that's when the real innovation starts to happen. So the key is to apply the fire principles across the whole spectrum of decision making. Now, I don't know what decisions you get to make. I don't know what problems you get to solve, but I suspect you do get to make some decisions and you get to solve some problems where you get to choose between alternatives, the more expensive or the less expensive, the faster or the slower, the more complex or the simpler. And so my suggestion is that, again, based on my experience, based on my, my research, um, the FIRE approach with its emphasis on speed, thrift, simplicity, and restraint uh, is a pretty good way to go. It tends to lead us in the direction of making good decisions about the things that we're making. Speaking of good decisions, let's talk about a failure for a second. Uh, the aircraft on, on the screen behind me is the F-20, a beautiful little aircraft uh, developed by Northrop to be a, a low-cost, simple-to-operate, simple-to-own uh, export fighter. So the idea was to sell this to our allies and, and, and other nations. Um, they very explicitly and deliberately sought out to design a low-cost, simple, restrained aircraft. It fits the fire pattern perfectly. Complete failure. Um, absolute failure. The bad news is nobody bought any. <laughs> um, so when I say it's a failure, that's only because it, nobody bought any. It apparently had, uh, you know, low maintenance costs, high reliability rates. It was going to do everything they set, it, set out to do. So from a technical perspective, this was a success. Uh, the tests, which unfortunately were, were never fully completed, but the initial tests that, that were performed said, boy, this is going to be a, a high performance, highly reliable, highly effective, low cost fighter jet. Um, but here's what happened. Under President Carter, the uh, uh, foreign military sales policy was that the F-16 was not available to sell to our allies. When President Reagan was elected, he changed that policy and said, you know what, I think it's okay. We can sell F-16s to other countries. All of a sudden, every other country wanted to buy an F-16, not an F-20, um, not, uh, not the Tiger Shark. 
Um, so this was probably a pretty good fit for the needs of a lot of these other countries, but because the F-16 was more advanced, it was five times more expensive, it was harder to fly, you could learn how to fly this in about three days, uh, it takes a bit longer to train up a, a pilot than the F-16. Um, but for whatever reason, the Allies preferred the more advanced fighter, even though it was literally overkill. Um, so the problem was that this aircraft did not satisfy the potential customer's expectations, didn't satisfy their assumptions, and unfortunately the world changed in a way that, that nobody could have anticipated. So that's one of the risks with this approach. When you take an approach that is fast, inexpensive, restrained, and elegant, where we've constrained the design, it's a simple, it, it's inexpensive, boy, this is, we have a risk of not being aligned with the people who are going to be using this thing that we're, we're creating, whether it's our bosses or our customers. So the, this, the way we address that risk is that this fire approach is something you want to do with your customers, not to your customers. With your boss, not to your boss. With your team, not to your team. So don't just come in and say, hey, I've got something that's very simple and it's not going to cost you anything and it's available right now. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was expecting something that was going to cost a lot more and take longer and be more complicated. And what I mean is I was expecting something that would do more. I was expecting the F-16, that's a highly advanced fighter, and not, why are you giving me this F-20? This has, doesn't have quite the same range or it's not quite as exciting. Um, so, but when we have these conversations up front and early, when we do it with people rather than to them, that helps mitigate the risk of finding yourself in a situation where you built something that's probably pretty good, but not well aligned with the customer's expectations and, uh, and interests. Okay, so I want to wrap up with a couple of selected heuristics uh, for your consideration. The funny thing about heuristics, or rules of thumb, is that no collection of heuristics is ever going to be complete. Uh, these are sort of a subjective way of describing trends and possibilities. And so if anybody says, here are the, the top 10 heuristics, these are the only ones you need to know. Oh, but there's always another nuance. There's always another one. So what I wanted to give is a deliberately incomplete list of the types of thinking, the types of principles that uh, this, fist con or this fire concept uh, addresses. So these are rules of thumb. They're designed to provide a starting point for additional thought. They're not prescriptive. They're not the end of the conversation. They're the start of the conversation. Uh, I offer them to help prime the pump. And this particular heuristic uh, is inspired by a large body of data and research that says simpler systems tend to outperform more expensive systems. Just like that uh, Army OIF report said that complexity reduces systems to irrelevance. A simpler design will work just fine. Now the future is awfully hard to predict and the distant future is particularly difficult. So this means we've got a really good idea of what I need tomorrow and no idea what I need 10 years from now. Um, I was commissioned in 1994. Uh, the Cold War had just ended. 9-11 was still seven years away. Um, boy, we really didn't quite know what we needed to be building for. Uh, who knew that we'd, I would eventually end up in, in Afghanistan and all these other crazy stuff. So speed validates the need. Uh, we know what we need today. We know what we need tomorrow. But boy, 10 years from now, it's awfully hard to predict what those needs are. So the shorter the schedule, the more likely the requirement statement is to be valid. Uh, if we need something right away, it's almost certainly a real need. If we need something in 2030, hmm, not so sure. Now, this isn't just about how we write code, how we define processes. It also speaks to how we communicate. So if you ever find yourself getting up and giving a PowerPoint presentation and saying, I know no one can read this chart, but um, take that as a sign you probably shouldn't be using that chart in the first place. Okay? You, you might as well just ask your audience to go ahead and close your eyes for this chart because I know you can't read it. Um, you would never ask your audience to just close their eyes. Um, so any, any graphics, any charts we use should be clear, should be focused, should be supportive of the speaker's point. And man, the, the way we communicate with each other matters. Uh, I often say, you know, you don't have my permission to bore me. You don't have my permission to, to be unclear when you're talking to me. Um, I would rather be interesting and engaging uh, and have charts that, that look like this. So again, if the audience can't read it, the briefer don't need it. All right, so I'm going to leave you with a couple titles for some additional reading. Uh, Dr. Alex Loffer uh, wrote a great paper. It's available online and a really nice summary of the 99 rules that NASA, the, the deep engineering practices, the deep management practices, the deep leadership practices that NASA leveraged when they did their world-class R&D projects uh, in the 1990s. Um, one thing I didn't mention, let me go into a little bit more, one last fact on Faster, Better, Cheaper. 1999 was a terrible year for Faster, Better, Cheaper. Four out of five missions failed. Um, and that's why NASA no longer uses the Faster, Better, Cheaper method. Now, when you have a seven-year time period with a 90% success rate and then a one-year time period where four out of five fail, an 80% failure rate, the natural conclusion, to my mind, shouldn't be, well, there's something you know, inherently wrong with the method. I would think a clustering of failure data like that means something happened later, something happened on those final projects that, that was different than those first couple. Um, nevertheless, NASA did the math. They said, 
10 out of 16 missions succeeded. That's a 62% success rate. Clearly, faster, better, cheaper doesn't succeed often enough. So we need to abandon that method. It's, it's funny math. I understand the math, but uh, I would suggest doing the math a little bit differently. The total cost for all 16 missions, total cost for all 16 missions was less than what NASA spent on Cassini. Now, Cassini is a huge success. They're doing great art. They're doing great science. They're doing amazing things out at Saturn. And even still now, they're still coming up with amazing stuff. But for the total amount of money we spent on Cassini, NASA also got 16 other missions. Only 10 of those missions succeeded, 10 out of 16. So that means all NASA got was 10 successes for the price of one. That's a pretty good deal. Even if it was two successes for the price of one, probably a pretty good deal. Uh, that's the type of math that I would suggest we do because there's no limit to the number of, of attempts we can make. There's only a limit to the amount of time and money we have. And if we can make 16 attempts with a certain amount of time and money or make one attempt with that same amount of time and money, we really are better off making those 16 attempts because, boy, if you put all that time and money into one project and it fails, you've got a 0% success rate. Um, so again, we should be counting, counting our successes based on you know, success per dollar and success per day uh, versus success per attempt. So anyway, uh, Dr. Loffer goes into some of that. Uh, ben Rich wrote a great, work, a great book called uh, Skunk Works, goes into the, the, deep into the history of Skunk Works. Skunk Works is responsible for aircraft like the U-2, the SR-71, the F-117, and the amount of new capabilities that those guys delivered, literally with no time, no money, and no people, is really stunning. Uh, and finally, uh, Colonel Burton's book gives a great blow-by-blow -blow account of several defense technology programs, including the F-16, the A-10, the Bradley Fighting Vehicle. The movie is great. Uh, the book's even better. Uh, the book's not as funny as the movie. Um, highly recommend both, but uh, definitely do, do read the book. So we've come to the end of my charts. I want to make sure everybody has a copy of my, uh, my email address. Would love to uh, spend a little bit of time answering some questions and, and uh, taking your comments, but would also love to hear from you if, uh, if you want to, to reach out. Um, and even if you just want to you know, send me a note and ask me to send you a copy of the um, Build Droids, Not Death Stars, I mean, you can Google it as well. Uh, but we're happy to, to pass that along, as, uh, too. So uh, at this point, uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, what are your questions?